is the Glass Cannon Network. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Get in the Trunk. Season four! Man, getting getting high up into the teens now as we enter episode 16, which I could be mistaken, but I think this is our record. Uh, I didn't look back. I just thought of it this second. This, I think, is the longest season of Delta Green so far. I don't oh, think wow. we ever made it to an episode 16. Troy, get on the fact checking for me. I, I'm I on uh, the amazing website, glasscannonnetwork.com. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a gorgeous site. It is absolutely <laughs> stunning. Do they have a newsletter we could sign up for? for <laughs> As a matter of fact, they do. Um, be sure to subscribe to find out all of the news on the three times a year I send a newsletter. <laughs> uh, season three went to episode 13. Season one, excuse me, season two went to episode oh, 15. Oh, oh wow. wow. And season one ended in 10. Yeah, so this is the longest is season it. ever. Wow. We're, we're deeper in the trunk than anyone has ever been. It's yeah, so right. this is the farthest from home. I've ever been. Uh, great work. Uh, and who knows? I mean, this could be the end. It could not be. It, it depends on, on how you guys play it. I mean, we just, we love playing this game. So maybe we just, we just keep going. <laughs> Screw it. The show's uh, too hot to end it. The now. show is just too <laughs> hot. Before we get into it, though, I do want to take a moment to shout out our good friend, Corgian, who's typically producing these shows. He is a resident of Florida. And he had to get out of Florida, no Florida and he can't do this episode, which is such a bummer. We're, we're sorry. We miss you. Uh, he's okay. His house is okay, but he has some friends that basically lost everything. So yeah. he's like, um, he's in Tampa, right? Isn't he like, yeah, or, I think yeah. so. Or he, he's um, closer to Orlando, I think. Oh, is he? Okay. I oh. think so. Okay. In either case, uh, we our thoughts go out to everybody in Florida uh, who experiences- our North Foundry buddies too. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. in rough shape. Oh, yeah, man. yeah. Eric uh, had some a close shave there, but he's fine. There, the warehouse is fine. The dice are all fine. They rolled a natural twenty on there. <sighs> Save there. Thank God so. about the dice. Forget about <laughs> Eric. Thank God the dice are okay. Yeah, the, but don't worry. The dice are fine. <laughs> We've got a New York show in a couple of weeks. We need the dice. <laughs> Thank you for the tweets. Thank you for the emails. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're 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 glad uh, you guys made it through, and uh, you know our our thoughts go out uh, to everybody down there right now uh, as we try to recover from this and try to just focus on something else. Something, I don't want to say silly, because it is pretty intense here in Delta Greenland. Francis, I love starting shows off with you, to be honest, because we just, wow. I talk to these other three non-stop, <laughs> like so many days a week. There's so much bant happening uh, on that <laughs> side of the table that I, I don't get to talk to you enough. And I just oh. want to check in, I'm just curious, over your stretch here. Now, document it, the longest stretch of a Delta Green operation there has been. How have things changed or how are they different from when you started the season and went in to kind of where you are now with the game? How are you thinking about it now and how are you approaching it? Oh, well now, I mean, I, I when I first started out, I, I honestly had no idea. Well, not no idea. I had some idea from listening to the, the other seasons, mm -hmm. but just like as far as how the mechanics would go, I definitely took some time getting into like how that all works, but I feel much more comfortable now. And when it comes to just like kind of trying new things or trying to, you know, just feel my way around in the character or in the, uh, in the world, but I'm constantly scared. <laughs> like now that we're in the night floors, I have like anxiety when I'm like, I'm listening to you describe it. And I'm just like, I'm sweating. And I'm just like, hey, is this, is this going to be okay? Are we going to be okay? Um, it's, it's really, honestly, I didn't think I would be this affected by it at this point, but I'm still like, once we get into it, I'm like, Oh God. Oh God, are we going to make it? Am I going to die? <laughs> <laughs> and how great. much of that is you as a player, your experience with this horror game? And how much of that is Bobby, do you think? Like how much, because you're really playing him as kind of scared of like yeah. everything that's happening around him. I which mean, to me is like such a good view of it from the average viewer, right? Like yeah. they see it through his eyes. 
that's what that's where I felt like it works because Bobby is you know just coming into this and as like uh, a CIA guy who has been like you know kind of just working in the like Cold War world and he probably feels like he's seen everything you know he does there's nothing that he thinks is gonna be weird until he comes to Delta Green and then it's like holy shit everything's fucking this is like nothing he's ever experienced before so it's like he's really having trouble and he 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 he's a type of guy who thought he had a good handle on things. You know what I mean? Like he thought he was on top of like just about everything. And when he comes into this world, it's like, it's, it's shaking him, shaking him to his core. That's, that's how I feel. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. And I think that it's, it's just a great way for people to view the show. I mean, not everybody can watch the show like <laughs> through cum stone eyes. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Like very few people come to the show and are just like, Oh, this isn't scary at all. I don't care. I'll kill everything. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Troy. It's a great how, song, it, though. Sorry. I love that song. Comes, Comes on eyes. I know. I'm feeling something between you and I. Comes on eyes. Comes on eyes. We were doing all these 80s songs before. Yeah, yeah. We want to find somebody that can sing Billy Ocean like Billy Ocean. Yeah. Maybe we can do a version of Get out of my dreams. Yeah. yeah. We we need need get into Billy Ocean my version. trunk. Get into my trunk, baby. Oh, yeah. Get into my trunk, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Sydney, your thoughts on the '80s as a, a decade of music? Um, I like some '80s music. Uh, Ooh. it's all right. It was weird. It was a weird time. Looking back on it, for, I'm sure it just looks like we're it, we're crazy is, people. Is Jefferson Starship '80s? Is that considered '80s? Starship, yes. Yeah, Starship was. I like yeah. Jefferson. When they Starship. transformed from an airplane into a starship, that happened yeah. in the '80s. Powered by <laughs> drugs. Why did <laughs> fueled by cocaine. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I I also love. Um, I know this movie is not the '80s, but I love the Wedding Singer, and I ah. feel like the soundtrack to the Wedding Singer has a oh. lot of '80s music. It uh, definitely yeah. does. Oh yeah. So far, great. you've yeah. named two non-'80s. Movies. <laughs> 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 no, Jefferson Starship is '80s, isn't it? Yeah, no, the Jefferson Starship. Shut right. up, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> We built this city. Zane. They totally built this Yeah, that city. song's not good. How oh, dare you? What? <laughs> wow. Marconi <laughs> plays what... La Bamba. Hot, hot, take. Radio. hot take from Sidster. Oh. I just wanted to see what Troy's reaction was. Um, no. <laughs> Who even I think are 80s you? music is great bar music because everybody knows the songs. Everybody knows at least the chorus to a song. So everyone joins in, no matter what it is. Yeah. yeah. No, that's you, good I have not thought obviously, of The Wedding Singer in quite a long time. And as soon as you said it, I just thought of that opening scene, which I loved, where it comes in with like him doing the, the show, whatever, play the wedding. It's just like, you spin me right around me. Right around. That song is so good. I loved that song when I was a kid. <laughs> that just soundtrack is amazing. There's the, um, yeah. it's not the uh, Bugles. It's who did Video Kill the Radio Star for that soundtrack? It's, uh, oh. God, it's so good. I forget. Dexie's Midnight Marauders or something it's like that. That was one Come off. On Eileen. Oh, right. right. Dexie's so Midnight stuff. Runners. Right, Midnight uh, Runners, yeah. Uh, the yeah. Buggles. Oh, it is the, it is the Buggles. Buggles. Yeah, you, you said the Bugles. Bugles? Bugles? Yeah. 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 Uh, God, that song's so good. That's what I think of when I think of that movie. <laughs> yeah, that, that song. I think that song came out in 1980. Boom. Oh, maybe uh, I'm wrong. There you go, uh, Troy. But, but yeah. That was, was like, like the first MTV music video, I think. Yeah. Right, that's what I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, I have a very dark story about that. That I know I won't tell, but uh, it was pretty intense. Let me tell you after the after the show. Yeah, <laughs> okay. do it off, man. Why do, do you always do that? You always tease the audience with juicy <laughs> stuff and then just pull it away. Well, it's just it's very dark, and I don't think it, it goes into themes that I don't think people would be interested in. We're but I can tan get in the trunk. It's a I can dark tangentially game. say I took uh, intro to feminism in my senior year in college, and they played this video once where they were interspersing. Uh, MTV music videos and it showed that one with some dark cinema and like people were just walking out because it was so hard to watch. So whenever I hear of Video Killed the Radio Star, I oh. always think of that oh, uh, intro feminism class. Wow. Hey. Uh, it had this like world famous uh, feminist that taught this. She used to not allow men to be in the class. It was a whole thing and uh, I can't remember her name. But anyways, that's the only thing I think of when I think of that song. Wow. Oh. wow. And it was actually in it premiered in 1979. Ah. Oh. It was under the release. Huh. So another 
No Navy truck. <laughs> Sid, you're just shooting darts left and right. <laughs> Shoot. Sid, he's over three. They're coming to the bottom of the eight, and they're gonna bring in a pinch hitter. Journey. 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 Did you just Journey. say Gurney? Gurney. <laughs> I believe it's pronounced Gurney. Like Gurney, that, that <laughs> cool band with the uh, Filipino lead singer. Two <laughs> thousand <laughs> Journey. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> well, um, you guys have done three episodes heading into this of full on night floors, and last week we really got the. The opportunity to see the at the end of last week. Well, you know what? Let me don't let me. I, I don't want to skip ahead. Last week's episode, in a brief recap, had Roger finding. Well, in the previous episode, his bottle behind uh, a, a broken wall that this old woman seemed to be what hacking her way through or something. He sees it right there, a bottle with the name Roger Cumstone on it. He tries to break down the wall to get to it, but the whole ceiling collapses in, and uh, he's not able to get to it and so he leaves and continues his way down the hall where he hears the uh sounds of love making uses a <laughs> what's it uh, sledgehammer, sledgehammer to just smash the lock off the door bust into this room no one is present however there is a bed full of blood a bag a, a leather valise filled with cash and blood all in the cash a couple of shotguns and smattered on the wall in some blue-black ichor, where is my bottle? Something about this bottle theme. As we go over to Sydney, <laughs> Sydney, as we go over to- I'm there. Vicky <laughs> oh, no. and Neil no. and Bobby, who are yeah. alone and lost in the night floors, Vicky says, speaking of the bottle, I wanna get back to the room with the pictures of the bottles. At least then we can reset ourselves and start to strike out again from a place where we know. She is able to find her way back there and thus to the smoking lounge where you had entered. And, and, and there in the smoking lounge is a man named Mark Rourke who is interested in buying you a drink and spending some time with you. It seems like a man out of time, something out of the 30s. He seems very friendly, buys you a couple drinks, chats you up, finds out you have an invitation to the party and is like, well, you're bolder than me. Uh, I'm not ready for that. Uh, you, you ready for what? Ready to go to the party. Because uh, when you go to the party, that's it. You never come back down. Abigail, it seems, took this journey. Chose to go up. Chose to live on floors that you can never return from. At this point, uh, you guys, after questioning him for a while and really getting some clear answers, but some not, he says he's been there for a year very strange. Seems like he's right out of the 1930s. He seems to think he's in a hotel. You know, the night manager says that you're in the McAllister building. You know, what's going on with these different uh, perceptions on, on reality? As he says his goodbyes and leaves, he runs into Roger, who is now dual-wielding shotguns. <laughs> or no, does he have a one shotgun and a sledgehammer? Whatever it is, yeah. he's very scary looking. And he threatens <laughs> Rourke, threatens to kill him flat out if he doesn't tell him how he's gonna get back to his Brooklyn apartment, how Mark Rourke is gonna get back to his Brooklyn apartment. Mark just says, I don't wanna go back to my Brooklyn apartment. I've never tried. All these mysteries culminate in the four of you returning together in the smoking lounge and deciding to leave the night floors because the door is now there again. You walk out and all of the reality, I wanna say, of what had happened in that place all of the unnaturalness of it comes down at once on top of you. And mechanically, within the game, it's that you don't actually take sanity loss until you leave the night floors, but it keeps racking up. You come out, it all hits at once. Some of you uh, push it off and, and um, project it, some of you don't. And we're left with a situation where Neil takes enough damage, I think six points, and he goes temporary, he experiences temporary insanity, which causes him to flee from the scene immediately. He runs down the steps of the McAllister building, out the front door, and just starts sprinting down 32nd Street, heading west. And that's the last we saw of Neil. Inside, Roger starts to just bang on doors on the top floor of this building. Ah! Ah, get out of here! He's 
that's how his his this sanity loss, which was I believe two points for Roger, is manifesting itself. As he's slamming on this door, he notices that the walls seem to be bubbling almost. The wallpaper seems to be waving and bubbling, and he discovers that under the wallpaper are millions of spiders. And as he's banging on the door, the wallpaper starts to rip. Spiders start to fall from the walls. And he gets out the shotgun and he's just like, the building's alive! Starts firing off shotgun (laughs) shells into the wall. This obviously explodes into more spiders just falling out, falling all over everyone. Bobby's going... (laughs) This is amazing because Vicky's going, running away, going downstairs like... Roger, stop! <laughs> and, and Bobby's going, kill it! Kill the building! <laughs> kill the building. I mean, what an amazing epic scene to end on. But it is Vicky, and I feel like this is important, who is able to calm Roger down. Maybe she's becoming a an anchor for him. Maybe she's becoming a bond. She says, touches his shoulder, you have to stop. He says, none of this is real, but she is. I'm going to listen to her. Vicky calms him down, and you guys get back down and into Abigail Wright's apartment. And that is where we ended last week's episode. <sighs> before we hop in, though, let's, or before we hop into that apartment, though, let's go. Let's see. Let's go to Neil. We'll go open on a scene that's outside. Nighttime, almost 10 p.m. It's Saturday night, August 20th. Sorry, August 19th, 1995. Relatively nice night as the rain came through and got rid of some of the suffocating heat of the earlier in the week. Neil's running down the street and then just stops out of sheer exhaustion. Just gets about two blocks, but he's a dead sprint. And also, the temporary insanity mechanically is leaving him. It only lasts for a couple minutes. And he just... (sighs) And Neil, you just hear... (sighs) Clear as a bell. A party to celebrate the new king. Come to dine. And it sounds like this voice is right behind you. Come to dance. Come. What does he do? So I picture like I I was running down. It's 32nd Street, right? Correct. Yeah, so I'm running that 36th, like, like dodging traffic like across like Park Avenue. And I like I stop in the middle of a block. It's like dark, like not a lot of people around. And yet I hear this. It's like, and I like the madness leaves me, but then it's just like this whiplash of it coming back. And I, boom, and I turn around to see if there's anyone there. You turn around and the block is just empty behind you. You see trash cans along the brick walls of these brownstones that you're running by. And you hear the distant barking of a dog. (laughs) <laughs> shaking of a chain and you don't see anybody behind you and then you just hear behind you in the other direction three he just turns it like not as not as uh, violently this time he just sort of like turns his head to look over his shoulder behind him and no one's there the voice was the same Sounded like a man's voice, a slight accent. He just lo- sort of like looks up. He's just like, "Who are you?" It just sounds like he's got to just look like just this. He's walking by. Just, this is a crazy guy on the streets of New York, right? Talking to himself. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Yeah. And you just hear again, same voice. I've got an invitation. He looks in his jacket pocket, the vest pocket, to see if he still has the invitation that he was carrying. You go into your vest pocket, 
and as you pull your hand out, you see what looks like... Imagine a campfire has burned all the way down, and it's the next day. Sort of a white ash, kind of. And not a lot. Not like, oh, full of ah. Just like a, you have like a dozen, almost slightly larger than sand-sized little like filaments, basically, of ash uh, that seem to be residual in your pocket, and there's no invitation. So now, this is this is the moment of crisis because now, despite having calmed down. He's wondering, is any of this real? So he like goes to his uh, camera bag and he starts like going through the grabbing like a fistful of photos Mm -hmm. and just like going through them to see if like he any of this happened. Yep. You go in, you grab the photos and you start flipping them and it's just all white, (laughs) all white, (laughs) all white, (laughs) all white, every single one. And they they look like completely blown out, you know, as if you were just taking pictures of the sun or something. Like it's just right. all white, all white, one after another, after another. And they, I imagine they just start like falling out of your hands, like onto the street. He starts walking back towards the apartment getting himself together yeah. okay sorry I got a phone call from uh, an unknown number I gotta take this <laughs> <laughs> must be important must start part calling at this hour it's part, it's, important. Sh- it's part of the show this is crazy how in depth <laughs> Joe is an unknown number who could yeah. this be yeah. I wouldn't That's be surprised strange. if like McDermott was calling you during the show right. to freak us out <laughs> <laughs> from an unknown number yeah <laughs> like route this call through Houston uh, <laughs> all right so um <laughs> that's why Sydney was there <laughs> she's, she's setting up a relay months ago I was months in ago <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's, months ago you were in Houston yeah, that's uh, dedication <laughs> All right Neil will start working his way back and will fade from Neil walking now east again on 32nd Street and go back into the apartment with the three of you. And I imagine just moments after we left last episode, you get in the room. Tell me what happens. How does it start? Vicky, start the scene. Uh, Vicky pushes Bobby and Roger like into the, she was leading Roger in by the shoulder, trying to hold him kind of throws them into the room, slams Abigail's door, lock, 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 like whatever locks, chain lock, 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 lock. And she's just panic, wide-eyed, like looking around. And she just runs to the sink in the kitchen and uh, turns on the cold water and just like splashes her face and reaching for her glass, grabs a glass, filling it up, like chugging the water, just trying to ground herself. You look down at the water uh, as you're chugging it and you just see that it is all blood. Stop! Stop! Oh, God. Stop it! She smashes the glass. Stop! <laughs> uh, uh, roll a sanity check. Oh, my God! No! Oh, right off the bat. Stop making me do terrible things. <laughs> I can't believe Vicky started drinking blood. Oh Bold God. choice. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh. No! It's, uh, fuck me. 68 under 56. Over 56. Oh, that is a fail. I know. That's one point <laughs> of sanity damage as you drop the glass, it shatters, and it's just water. It's just water, Vicky. You guys in the other room, you hear this glass shatter. What do you do? You hear a I sh- imagine sh- that's shout. the moment that, like, it dolly zooms on Roger and he, like, comes back and he looks around and doesn't see uh, Murnau. And he turns to makeshift and goes, go find Murnau, bring him back here. Unlock, 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 opens the door. Bobby just 
snaps out of it and is just like, okay, okay, okay. This is something that grounds him. He's going to do this. He's going, he's going out. He's going to go find him now. All right, Bobby leaves the room out the main door of the McAllister building, leaving Vicky and Roger alone. We come back to Roger. Bobby walks out the door. What do you do? He's he's pulling himself together. He's putting his gun back in his in his holster. He's just taking it in. He's looking around. This is this is Earth. We're we're in the city. He's he's, he's slowly starting to get his bearings. So he takes deep breaths. He looks around. He he just kind of. Did we see where Murnau went? We just saw him run out the door. You just saw we him run really? out the door. Okay. All but right. as you as you come out, uh, you see about a block and a half up. <laughs> I feel like I've said unmistakable too much in this show. But you see the unmistakable silhouette. And I choose that word carefully because <laughs> Neil looks a very certain way, even in yes. silhouette form. His height, his lankiness, his hair, uh, his stride. You can see him kind of every once in a while he appears under a streetlight. And then he can't quite see it. Then you see him again and he's walking calmly toward you. All right. Bobby walks up to to, to, to Murnau. Okay. So you guys meet about a block away, half block away. What happened? Hey. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. And he like just flicks his head like looking over his shoulder again. Did you, did you hear something? I don't know what I heard. I don't know what I saw. This is, this is, this is something I'm not. No, 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 no. Just, just now. Just now? No. No. What did you hear? Nothing. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay. All right. He's clearly not okay, but <laughs> he says he's okay. We we need to get back. We need to get together and figure out what the hell's going on. Okay. Yeah. You ready to go back? <sighs> yeah. Okay, let's go. Okay. Bobby's a little scared. He's scared, but he's he's trying to be strong. <laughs> he's like, okay, let's go. Bobby starts to walk. And as he gets a couple feet away from Neil, you hear this voice, Neil, as if it's right whispering in your ear behind you. And you just hear, the only way out is through. Jesus! So and you hear this, around. Jesus! What? And you didn't hear what? a voice. What? What? What is? What is happening? What? You didn't. You didn't hear that. No. What? What do you hear? Give me a sanity check to see how you handle this moment. Okay. Oh, God. Both of us are just just, just Neil. You, yeah, you don't yeah. really know, Bobby. You're on okay. edge. But you're uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sixty-nine. Over 50. Nice. nice. <laughs> uh, okay. Save me, Dell. Save me, Dell's rule. Uh, all right, so you take a point of sanity damage, and oh. you can either project that and not take it, manifest this scene how you want, or you can take it and manifest this scene how you want. You know, it's kind of how do you play this thing where Bobby says, what, what was that? I think I'm going, I'm going to try to, I'm going to project it on to Johnny again. Okay. Onto my mom. So, yeah. And I think, like, in that moment, he really is, like, projecting some of this, like, on, as much as he can onto her. Like, he's thinking back at, like, all the resentments that he had, like, from his childhood, the way that she can't seem to function without him. Like, as an adult, like, all the, like, care that he has to give her and everything. And it's just, like, if it wasn't for her, like, I wouldn't, I'd be, I'd be able to handle this better if it wasn't for her. Hmm. So oh, it's yeah, just, like, he's just transferring resentment. all of this into his, it's, it's transmogrifying itself into this resentment for her in the moment. Awesome. And it's not very effective because he only got one point off of the previous sanity loss and then this point here. 
but it's just a little bit like he's able to salvage a little bit of his own sanity by doing this you also need to take a point of willpower point damage for the projection okay uh <laughs> but what does bobby see neil he just sees you what you say jesus and then he turns around what, what what's wrong <laughs> what does neil actually say or do I'm asking you, Neil. Oh, uh, and he, and this, this wave of, uh, sort of anger, like goes, crosses over his face. And, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Let's just, let's just get back in there. Nothing. It's nothing. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Bobby's not convinced, but he'll take it. <laughs> so we'll walk. Okay. You guys head back in, and then we'll go into Roger and Vicky. What's happening inside? Roger is... Uh, once he sees makeshift leave, he's uh, he like starts grabbing at his neck. And uh, he's like, Maybelline, Maybelline. And he, he looks for uh, uh, Van Fitz's bathroom. Goes into the bathroom. He's just calling her as he goes in. And he like rips his shirt off um, and turns on the shower and is like looking in there to see if he's covered in spiders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you you t- take off your shirt and spiders start coming out from within your oh, shirt like, oh, into fuck. the bathroom. Oh, God. Oh, oh. Man, it is the worst. We are all so lucky that Alicia is not on this particular oh, show. She would Nobody have hates spiders more than, than she does. Yeah, she would have, she would have quit the, the network. Call. This just the discussion of spiders. Just talking oh about it. Yeah. Okay, so so one time, uh, you guys know my buddy Matt Ambrosia, and so uh, we talked about him on this very show, uh, the guy who would uh, get super hungover, and that's when he was nice at work. So he, one day, <laughs> one day, <laughs> good description. One day we were at work, and I was in an office next to his office. We can't see each other. And I hear the most horrifying howl, scream. It sounded like someone being stabbed, just like, ah! So loud out of his office. <laughs> I, I go into his office and he's like this. <sighs> Jesus Christ. <sighs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> he had gotten in from work, took his coat off, thought he felt something as he took the coat off. And as he pulled his arm out, out of the arm of his coat, dropped a cockroach like this oh! thing. Oh. So it was like in his coat the oh. whole way from home. Oh. And he freaked <laughs> out. Oh. He screamed so loud. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I think of in this moment where it's like, you take that shirt off and there's spiders coming out of the shirt. So oh. I mean, it's just like they're, they're everywhere. You have a strange feeling like a like a sharp kind of pain in your right ear, inside your uh, ear. Oh, uh, no. Uh, so he, he looks over at the shower. Is it running? Yeah. All right. He's just like, Maybelline, Maybelline. And he gets in there, and he's just like letting the water uh, run over his head. This um, pressure in your right ear starts to increase, and it feels like a sharp pain in your ear. And he like sticks his finger in there and tries to grab it, whatever it is there. Like and you feel finger. something in there. And he tries <gasps> to scoop it out. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> if the finger isn't working, he grabs one of Van Fitz's toothbrushes and starts sticking that in there. <laughs> oh, God. You go, ah, you feel something in there and you pull it out. Jump. And then you hear this strange tink, tink, tink sound and a spider that is golden in color and metallic and unmoving falls into the tub is like ting, ting, and I mean it's very tiny splashes into the water and starts to like go down toward the drain you notice unmistakably by its weight and its color that it it looks like a it looks like it's gold um Roger sees that and just goes, 
Oh, boom! And punches <laughs> into the porcelain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, roll a strength times five. Let's see how much you hurt yourself, you dummy. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, like Dan Police I actually he, like broke his have... hand punching the mound after abandoning. <laughs> I may have failed the roll. Um, let's see, 17 times five. Yeah, 90 over 85. Oh, oh no. Wow. Oh, oh, my gosh. 90. Okay, so you fail the roll, which uh, I'm going to give you a dodge roll to not get hurt here. So go ahead, and because what's yeah, happening so is I you're slipping off balance. You're slipping off balance in a wet tub. Right, so I miss the spider, and I roll a 35 under 50, so I successfully dodge. Yeah, so you don't fall down and, like, hit, like, you, you get your footing, but this golden spider just runs down the drain and disappears. <sighs> Oh my god. <laughs> Maybelline, what do you do? And He's screaming for you and what, what yeah. are you doing? You just watching TV? No, when Maybelline <laughs> dropped the Make glass. Hot pockets. When Maybelline <laughs> dropped the glass, she immediately had the reflex to like try to catch it or save it, and she sliced her hand open on a huge piece of glass when um from the cup. So she would like was holding her hand and was in shock about the blood, but now realizes she's also in like bodily shock because she's bleeding so much from her hand. And she walks into the bathroom, like whole arm, because she was just standing in the kitchen, like trying to hold it. Whole arm is just covered in blood, like on her jacket, onto her shirt. And she walks into the bathroom and can she see Roger? Roger, are you in the shower? He's in the shower, yeah. Well, so is Roger's, the curtain open? Did you care about the curtain? Yeah, the curtain's open. I'm, I am I, mean, he's not completely naked. He's got, he mainly took his shirt off. He's getting his pants all wet and everything. But he uh, he turns and, and sees you, and you know he's he's huge, <laughs> like muscles upon muscles, and he's wet, and he sees your arm, and uh, he he gets out and he goes, "You all right? Who hurt you?" I cut, I cut my hand. And he he grabs your your arm, says, "Come here," and brings you over to the shower, and like holds your arm under the shower while putting. Uh, once the blood clears away and he sees where the wound is, he's like applying pressure. Like someone who, you know, has spent any time in the military would know what to do in this circumstance. So he's he's doing it and just uh, holding field it both. medicine. We're both just mm -hmm. getting uh, soaked, <laughs> wet. And my head's like half of the yeah. shower. Um, well, I can picture this. You tell me, City, but I can picture you taking this in and like he's holding your hand. And the water is like splashing off of your arm, like onto your face, and it's not even phasing you. Yeah, you're just like she, staring. She is so zonked, like exhausted from the night. They've been up for hours, exhausted from the night and everything that's happened. Now, actually, has a physical injury uh, upon her sanity injuries, and she is mentally and physically exhausted. And standing there as the water is splashing on her face, and she looks at Roger and she says. What are we doing? And Roger. Leans in to kiss her. She doesn't move. Wow. And Roger just plants one on her and uh, brings her in. She goes with it. Wow. Oh, fully goes with it. Not like it. fully goes with it, like is like making out and like grabbing him back, but mm -hmm. she is so like dead to the the whole like world around her right now that it's like a nice comforting thing and she can't even process what is going on with Roger. She's just like, okay, yep. Hand is still in the water, kissing back. And at this Blood. moment, the front door opens, and Bobby and Neil walk in from a room outside this bathroom. You won't see them immediately, but you, Bobby, you open the door. Oh, sorry, Troy, did you want to say something? You open the door, Bobby, and you hear the shower running. And the uh, unmistakable sounds of <laughs> love. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sexy in here. Uh, I know you Don't hear the shower in. running. No, you see blood on the floor, trickling from through the kitchen into the bathroom, through the living room. Alertness to see if I hear the door. Uh, twenty-eight under eighty. Yes, you hear the door through even the shower. That's how trained Cumstone is. <laughs> How many times in Kuwait? 
Bobby, uh, Bobby, uh, take your Bobby's, shower. <laughs> Republican Bobby calls God out. come bursting in. Bobby take calls out to uh, Maybelline, Messiah. Maybelline, Messiah. Yeah, Listen. Um, Roger stops, you know, before he knows they're going to come in, um, but just stays staring at Maybelline. And she's also just staring at him, like water still running. And she blinks a few times and looks him in the eyes and nods her head and then walks out of the bathroom just holding her hand up and she re-grasps where the, the cut is to put pressure on it and walks out. And uh, Roger just stands there letting the water run over him, just on another planet. Bobby, you see a crumpled up shirt on the corner of the bathroom floor and like two or three spiders just walking slowly <laughs> around the bathroom floor. <laughs> Bobby just takes a very deep breath. He breathes into his pocket and grabs a Xanax bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Cracks open to empty. Oh, shit. You pull it out. <laughs> You pull it out and you realize in your last, like, like when you just like chunked them dry uh, in the in the night floors, you didn't know at the time that was the end of the bottle. God damn it! Okay, pulls it up and there's nothing in there. All right, throws the bottle to the ground. Ding, 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 ding! Kills a spider. Takes two deep breaths. (laughs) We gotta, we gotta, we gotta get centered. We gotta figure out. We gotta. We, we just got to get grounded. Can you help me find a, a bandage in the bathroom? Right, right, right. Bobby takes the task and he, he looks around. He's he's just scanning for anything like a rag or uh, what? what is there anything like first aid kit in the bathroom? Should I roll a search? Let's see. I forgot. I forgot to bring my dice. Ooh. <laughs> I did too. I had to run off. And... But, um, yeah. Let's see. I'll do a. I'm gonna do a luck roll because I think this is right on the line here. If she has a first aid kit or band aids, uh, she does not. Oh shit. Okay. Um. You see, there's toilet paper in there, um, but I mean that's is, not gonna do much for you. In the towel, little... right? Like I. I yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. Is the towel okay? Bobby grabs a towel. Wraps it around Mabel. He tried to tie it tight with some pressure. I, I I don't want to step on your moment here, but I just remind everyone there is a oh, yeah. doctor available. <laughs> Murnell's a doctor. I mean, you know, <laughs> doctor. doctor. <laughs> what do I do? Just get a towel. <laughs> Make sure you move. Murnell, I didn't move. know Murnell was back. Murnell. Murnell. But is he a field <laughs> medic? Well, no, I'm sure I. <laughs> <laughs> Renal, a little help, a little help, Renal. Oh, okay. I come in, just like and he's like, God, and he like looks, is like, oh. And uh, are there like any? Is there any gauze or uh, antiseptic or anything? No, there's like no supplies. Yeah, I did. I just did a roll for it. If it was random, and there's just no supplies. I mean, there's uh, alcohol. I'll say it's like rubbing okay. alcohol. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll I'll take some rubbing alcohol and it's just like this is gonna sting a bit and he like just pours it on and it hurts like fucking hell oh fuck I know I know god damn it man now you're gonna need stitches and he's uh, and yeah he's putting pressure on it and he takes like a, a bath towel and or, um what are those like in between towels between like full hand, towels and hand towel? towel yeah hand towel hand towel so if there's one of those like he takes it and like puts pressure and like ties it up like good it's just like it's just like i can sew this up for you if i get my hands if i can get my medical kit i can take care of this thank you yeah that would (sighs) are you are you okay yeah fine and he and he like twitches again like did he hear something over his shoulder again he's just like and he he stops himself and roger no, I was gonna say, yeah, we're all fine. I think everybody is fine. At that moment, Roger comes out of the bathroom and he looks like 
Jason Momoa as Aquaman. (laughs) (laughs) Walking out of a waterfall. (laughs) But even larger. And uh, I mean, he comes out and he's just got like a face cloth that he's drying himself with. (laughs) We took the towel. That's all I could find. That's all I could find. Does anybody have any cigarettes? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We both in, yes. in unison is like yes. We all yes. Start smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Just taking this down. We need to. Uh, we need to talk. Yeah. Yeah. What time is it? What time is it? Ten, no time no time ready. passed. Yeah, so it's like only 11 or something, Joe? Uh, yep. Okay. Right around there. It's like, how much subjective time passed for us in there? Uh, subjective time, maybe six hours. Jesus. Yeah, because you were like lost for a while and yeah, researching stuff and yeah, it's a long time. I don't, I don't want to be here. I can't be here. We, I'm not. We can't talk here. I don't want to be here. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go. Agreed. You guys want to go to a bar or something? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And he hears bar. Neil hears bar and he just shoots a look at her. She doesn't even notice that you're like trying to give her a little high sign. She's like yeah. nervously shaking, smoking a cigarette and just like standing, tapping her foot. You hear a voice, Neil. It just says, would you be more comfortable going somewhere else? And he just like, he like turns around like towards the door and he's just like, fuck you. <laughs> but now he's just, he's looking back, he's like, sorry, sorry. Nothing. Who were you talking to? You didn't hear that, right? I heard it. What? You did? I heard something. Might not have been that. (laughs) I hear voices all the time. How did you know it was a voice? Because that's not what you heard, Roger. You heard a bump in the kitchen. Roger just like puts his cigarette in his mouth, pulls out his shotgun. <laughs> you were in a bath towel. You were the size in the of a wash shower. Right, he grabs you the shotgun, shotgun strapped to him in the, in the shower. I forgot I was naked. naked. All right, he <laughs> slowly grabs the shotgun. Off slowly grabs the, the shotgun and uses the barrel to like push the three of them behind him. And then starts walking down. And we hear like Vietnam era music. It's that time. As he's walking down the hall. I wish we could use that music. It's only in Roger's head. It is silent. Oh, God. I could totally see. Roger must be a huge <laughs> Chuck Norris fan. Watch those movies growing up. <laughs> yep. Delta Force. All right. Roger. <laughs> Roger comes up. Come stone. Roger <laughs> comes. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm never going to get through this episode. Uh, he comes up into the kitchen. And... As you come around the corner, you see that the refrigerator is a couple inches off base from where you know it was before. I guess it's been knocked or something, moved. Checking all his corners. Roll search. Seeing it. Oh, great. Oh, fuck. 57 over 40. Really good at hearing things uh, in other rooms. Not so good at finding shit once you're in it. 57 over 22. (laughs) I want to reallocate my skill points. <laughs> uh, you, you want to do a uh, a respec? <laughs> I want to respec. 
Um, what gem do I have to get? <laughs> gem. Go to some you know priestess. what, dude? <laughs> you know what? There might be one in the night floors. That's true. <laughs> you want to go back in there? You got to go find them. Um, find the respect gem. That's the new quest. <laughs> in this, uh, Delta Green. Find the gem. No, uh, I'm going to go full intelligence. <laughs> I'm going to do an <laughs> intelligence dex Charisma build. build. Uh, all right, you come into the kitchen and you don't see any anyone you don't see any sign of danger just that the refrigerator is moved from where it was Roger will go to the refrigerator and uh, open up the door to the freezer and to the actual uh, regular fridge itself anything different in there that jumps out yeah you open up the freezer the refrigerator looks the same you open up the freezer which was empty before it's just like kind of like frost around on the inside. You open up the freezer and you see what looks like the top of a wedding cake in the freezer with like a bride and groom, like little figurines in a tux and a white dress. And they're like frozen solid onto this frozen top of a wedding cake. Yeah. Reaches in, grabs the cake. Roll for initiative. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> he reaches in, grabs the cake. You see it's cold to the touch. It feels like cake. The frosting gives a little. He walks back into the other room, you know, shotgun like resting under his arm, holding the cake in two hands. The first person you see in that room is Vicky, who recognizes the top of the wedding cake. As the top of her wedding cake. Oh, fuck. And she was just making out with you in the bathroom. <laughs> Vicky, like a classic movie moment, cigarette in mouth. Drops the cigarette <laughs> from her mouth. <laughs> and slowly walks towards the freezer, looking directly at it. At the cake or at the freezer? The cake. Yep, you walk up, you look directly at it, and you can see that the little figurines on top, you can't remember. Are they identical to the ones you had? Are they different? But it's, you know, it's a similar vibe, and why else? Why else? You saw it in your dream. It was there in the dream. Her eyes start, like, welling up. Like, she is just speechless. And... She goes to touch it, just like Roger did, and she touch she touches it, and it's cake. It's real. Mm -hmm. And then she just bursts into tears. Oh. Just like on the spot, just like, <gasps> and she just smashes the top of the cake with her Whoa. good hand <laughs> out of Roger's hand. Just smashes it down onto the floor, <laughs> crying, and. Like it's and then steps on it also and just clash smash and she stops what she's doing. It looks around up at Roger. Te like face wet with tears, just sobs, and she looks back at Murnau in makeshift. And she walks out of the apartment. She just walks out. Well, what do you guys do while she's like super upset and is crying and stuff? You're all just standing there like shocked at this display of violence and rage and tears. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, Vicky was our rock up until this point and all of a sudden she's falling apart. I, she was Bob, the normal Bobby's, one. Yeah, Bobby's dumbfounded. His jaw is just hanging. He also can't process emotions, so he's just like frozen by the, by this display. And Vicky just starts walking out the door. And she's right. sobbing again. She's like, <laughs> like hyperventilating, just trying to get out of the room because she cannot be seen like this. Roger reaches down to grab the cake topper, like holds it up to the light and looks at it. And then he breaks apart the man and the woman. <laughs> Oh, 
puts the uh, woman back in the freezer and slides the man piece into his bomber jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, I'm going to go after her. <laughs> and just follows her out. Okay. Um... Vicky, please roll sanity. I didn't have you roll because I was so caught up in your amazing scene. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Sand check, please. Oh. oh, please roll low. Please roll low. Oh, th wait. Am I still? Oh, thank God. 52 under 55. Ooh, oh, wow. that is close. That is close. It's because she had a burst of emotion. She like normally she wouldn't got it do out. that. And she got it out. And it was mm. embarrassing for her. And she feels so uncomfortable now. Okay, um, let's follow Roger out of the building. And Vicky's on the street, crying and walking away. She's she's Kinda sat, like stumbling, stumbling towards home. She stopped. She's sitting on the sidewalk, legs on the street, just sobbing into her lap. She just gave up and walked two feet out the door and sat down. <laughs> Roger comes out, trips over her. Falls down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> ah, She's outside. She's outside. <laughs> oh my neck! Still naked. <laughs> still, still naked. naked. Still naked. Still He's sprawled on the on Thirty Second Street sidewalk, <laughs> nude. Just his shotgun goes up. off as he hits the ground. I think it was pretty clear that I came out with pants on, but I definitely have not said that I put my shirt on. Yeah. Um, so, right, so you come out. Hold on a second. I want to be clear here. You come out shirtless, pants on, no shoes. It's August. And you just, but that's all you have. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I've got the shotgun still. I've got the shotgun. <laughs> I got as one of the shotguns. As soon as you come out onto the step, the shotgun turns into a white ash in your hands. Oh, wow. And the night wind just <sighs> disintegrates it and blows it away. Roll sanity against the unnatural. <laughs> Picture, okay. Uh, you know, uh, whatever it's called. Uh, Sp I want to. Spider Man, Marvel, when they yes. turn to Ash. Uh, yeah, the, the, Infinity the Snap. War. Infinity the Snap. War. Yeah. Thinking yeah. Endgame. Picture <laughs> Infinity War. Um, so it's just like. <sighs> I don't <laughs> feel so good, Mister Clumstone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I made the, I made the, the, the roll. I got an eight under fifty nine, but I meant to look up and forgot how to establish a new breaking point. Because I hit my breaking point during the firing my gun into the spider hole. Your new breaking point <laughs> is your current pal minus your current sanity. Okay. I believe. I'll, I'll double check, but I think that that's it. Pow or will no. Current pow. Okay. Yeah, your, your pow. It's not your power points. It's, it's like your actual score. Uh, right, like if I'll, I have a power of 15, it's 15 It's minus. 15 more points to your next breaking point, I gotcha. believe. Um, you think so that thing drifts that. away and you take a point of sanity damage really yes this is I mean could not be that thing could not have been heavier or more real in your hand a moment ago and the only reason you don't suffer more damage is because you passed the sanity check but this yeah. is unmistakably purely unnatural unreal and now it's really starting to get to the point. I'm thinking of you at the end of last week, just being like, the building's alive, and then being like, that's not real. Like, <laughs> you really don't know what's real and what isn't. Like, I mean, that shotgun was as real as real could be just a moment ago. Think about how you apply that to your real life. What then is real, you know? Yeah. Well, for Roger, that's, he's been feeling that ever since he woke up. Um, yeah, so he turns back to the building and looks, still sees the hallway and, and whatnot. Um, and he just says, uh, you all right? And Vicky is sobbing. Um, <laughs> just leave me alone. I don't want, I can't, I can't. I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Roger uh, gets down next to her and like puts his 20-inch pythons 
around her <laughs> and <laughs> just like pulls her in close like with like enough pressure so that like it's just at the brink of almost hurting like secure <laughs> like a security blanket my thunder thunder shirt like a dog um, <laughs> And she's just sobbing into your chest, taking comfort in it. And she slowly- it's warm pectoral. <laughs> right, you're shirtless, warm chest. <laughs> like glistening in the sun, <laughs> glistening in the, in My the water. My tears are making it so shiny. Uh, and she, <laughs> I feel like I can't breathe. I feel like I can't breathe. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. Just do me a favor. Inhale. Count to four. Do it. I'll do it with you. Ready? One, two, three, four. Now hold that breath. Hold it. Hold it and count to seven. One, two, three. <laughs> Trying to kill her. Okay. Trying to kill her. <laughs> Trying to put her to sleep. All right, now. Now when we get to seven, we're going to exhale slowly and count to eight. One. And this process is actually something that will slow her heart rate down. Um, so after two of those, the heart rate should be back normalized. And she is breathing deeply. I feel, I feel like such a bad person in so many ways. And I feel like I fucked everything up. Do you know what I mean? I do. No, you don't. You'd be surprised. I think we're all bad people. We just gotta be the most good bad there is. <laughs> I want to get rid of everything that's in there. I want to destroy all of it. Then what? I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I want to... I feel like I want to tear myself in half. I don't know. What's your name? Your real name? Why are you asking me that? You know mine. What's yours? Victoria, but I just go by Vicky. Vicky. I kind of like Victoria. <laughs> You've Roger. always... No, what? <laughs> Is Roger your real name? Yeah. No one calls me Raj. Okay, yeah, I don't really like it. I'm gonna call you Roger if that's okay. So here we are. Victoria and Roger. Two lost souls just swimming in a fishbowl. <laughs> you kissed me in the bathroom. Yeah. Why? Everyone. I've been wanting to do that since I saw you in the park. I'm, um, I'm married. I'm, I'm married. How's that going? <laughs> I don't know, actually. I don't actually know. You want to hear something crazy? Yeah. There's some days that I wake up and I feel like I'm married to or that I was married. I'll get up and I expect someone to be in the kitchen doing the crossword puzzle. 
what I remember. There was a time when there were sounds of children laughing and playing in the other room. But then it's gone and I wake up and I'm alone. You're not married? I don't know. No. Not right now. I think I know what you mean. I used to kind of feel that way when I was with... Before, well, I'm... With my husband, I would kind of have these thoughts like, you know, we moved out of the city and we had kids, and we had a dog. And sometimes I would think I would like hear them or something and I don't know, then other times I would imagine being completely on my own. And I would be so happy. I should, um, we should get out of the street. Yeah, I need a shirt. We also don't have any <laughs> shoes on. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure you were all right. Thank you. Roger, really. Thank you. And if you get up to start to walk back, he, he lingers and he's like, you know, I always had this dream just getting away from it all, moving to an island, cutting myself off from everyone and everything. I thought that would be perfect, like what you're saying. <laughs> you know, it's funny, sometimes I forget. We're on a fucking island right now. <laughs> I, wish it, I wish it could be like paradise. Maybe it still can. <laughs> should get um should get Manau and, and make sure make sure they're go okay inside. All right. Up oh, you go ahead. And he He stays back. Okay, Vicky goes ahead inside. Because <laughs> he has an erection. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Way to ruin a perfectly stand great up. scene. Just stand up. Come on, let me go. He wants to wait a second. <laughs> Give him this. Give him it. No problem. Take your time. <laughs> He's honest. He's honest. It's not even sexual. It's just there's a lot that went on there. And it... <laughs> it's a fear boner. It's a fear boner. He's crying, <laughs> sobbing into his bare chest. Now that's hot. <laughs> Jesus. All right, let's go. God, let's go back into Bobby and Neil. Um, Bobby, you finding out you're out of pills. Neil shares a sig with you. Um, Vicky runs out, s storms out, and Roger follows her, and they're gone for a chunk of time. What do you guys do? Bobby. Bobby is trying to get grounded. He's he's remembering the the mission. Our mission. We stick to the mission. That's the only thing he knows is it, as the re, the re, the reality of what we're doing here. We got. We have to remember the mission. And he says to him now, Francis. I just want to applaud you. I think you're the first Delta Green player in history to actually do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, <laughs> You're really starting to understand the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only it's the only thing that he could grab onto because he's just he's just he doesn't know what he's seen. He's he's freaking out. He's he's like, there's a mission. There's a mission here. Yeah. To Murnau. Uh, I love he it. He goes to Murnau. Continue. Murnau. We gotta. We need to stay focused. We gotta stay focused on the mission. Yeah, and I think Murnau is he when makeshift says that he's just he's like he's right and he's like to center himself to focus himself he just keeps thinking about his resentment towards his mom 
He just like he like shifts like all his like wandering thoughts about like what happened in there, what's real, what isn't. He just focuses it all on this resentment. It's like he, at least he knows that that's real, and so he's just he's using that as an anchor to get him back into the mission. Right. Now. Yeah. Okay. Right. So. What is the mission? <laughs> like at so, this point, <laughs> you need to see something. And he pulls out the photos, the Polaroids, and he fans them out. So the the blanks that he's that he's got that he's left with. These these were the photos you took in the knife floors. Yeah. All right. And he looks and he grabs makeshift. He's like, listen, all we have is each other. We were both in there together. The four of us, we were in there together. We know what's real. You can't forget that. You can't forget each other. You're right. Alone, we're lost. Together. You're right. Bobby shakes. Bobby's agreeing. <laughs> he... He's thinking. He's trying to think. Uh, So, Francis, I'll just clarify for you what you would know, which is the mission. The mission is discover if Abigail Wright's disappearance has anything to do with the unnatural. If it does, destroy it. Get rid of it. That was the mission. All right. All right. He looks burnout dead in the eyes. We need to burn this whole place to the ground. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Like, eradicate it. We might need explosives. Yeah. It's the only way to be sure. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Bobby, or uh, Vicky, opens the door and walks back in. Maybelline. You hey, okay? I'm fine, and I don't want to talk about it. I'm covered in cake. I look like <laughs> shit. My makeup is running, and all I want to do is have a drink. So I am going to rinse off this cake, and you are going to think of a nearby bar, and we are going to go there so we can talk about what's going on and fucking finish this thing. Because if I have to step foot in this building one more fucking time, I'm going to have to get another therapist. And I already have one. And she's pretty expensive. Okay. (laughs) Listen, we'll go to a bar. I know know a great one not too far from here. Very nice atmosphere. But look, and he points her hand. It's like, you, your wounds need attention. Let's at least, let's stop at a Dwayne Reed on the way. Take care of that. Go to the bar. You're a really good doctor. I actually forgot about my hand because I think I have so much adrenaline pumping through me. It's only natural. Okay, I'm gonna get this cake off me. I look like absolute trash. Your is off. All right. So the plan is to head out. Yeah. Yeah. We should. I mean, just scan the place, grab whatever. I mean. We already cleared out her apartment of like any kind of incriminating stuff, right? We, we any kind of supernatural incriminating things. Well, yeah. So there, there actually is two parts of the mission. The Delta Green part of the mission, which was given to you by Agent Marcus, is find out if this girl's going missing has anything to do with the unnatural or this occult symbol that was caught by our by. Uh, uh, Oh my God, I forget what they're called. A cell. It was caught by a cell, which is like it the does. higher ups. Mission accomplished. Uh, and. Uh, if it was destroy it, and Marcus was like, just just destroy it. Like he was super paranoid. It's like he didn't want to know anything about it. You don't know why. So don't know why that guy was all like jittery. And then the uh, second part of the mission is the overlay over it, which this happens a lot in Delta Green uh, as a game. It's like there's the visible mission to the to law enforcement, which in this case was taking pictures and categorizing all the evidence and returning that to the FBI. That you're also done. 
but you have not returned it to the FBI. You have all the photos and all the categorizations of all the um, evidence, and you feel that you have sufficiently um, left out anything that would lead to the supernatural or the evidence of the supernatural. Everything is pretty mundane. It doesn't make any sense. It does not lead to uh, solving the case, but you did your job. That's kind of like where you're at right now. Okay. <clears throat> when Roger right. comes back in and puts his shirt on, he's just going to stumble back over to the fridge. Something was nagging him in the back of his head, and he's going to just continue pushing it. Like, he remembered seeing that it was off the wall a little bit, and he checked mm -hmm. inside, but he wanted to look behind and under it. He's going to push the fridge. You... Push the fridge out of the way, and you don't see anything. A dusty, dirty linoleum floor. Cabinets above the fridge. Nothing unusual that wasn't already categorized, gone through, discussed. The only thing that happened in this in this room that wasn't there that you, could you guys remember mechanically? Uh, you have picked this place apart by the rules, right? Like you have spent days rolling search rolls and hours for every roll. So yeah, you guys are really familiar with this place now. And the only thing that happened out of the ordinary after you came out of there was that cake, but also the blood, which only Vicky saw hasn't mentioned to anybody. Let's get a drink. Talk. Yes. Okay, so the team... Oh, wait, wait, quick question. Does Abigail have any clothes in her closet? Because I think Vicky might need a change of clothes. Is there any clothes there? Are there um, any? Let's see. Luck, luck roll? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, huh, critical success. Oh, oh, she finds... They're not only clothes, but clothes that fit you. <laughs> she finds a hot little number. And <laughs> she puts on a form-fitting dress. And ooh, the shoes fit her too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she just throws on a dress and another jacket uh, and shoes, and she puts her stuff in a bag and just carries all her shitty cake clothes. <laughs> okay. And leaves the building. We'll follow you. Get, we'll pick up with you guys already seated, already with drinks in front of you. Does Vicky have a drink? Well, I wanted to stop at... We oh. don't have to play this out, but I wanted to oh. stop at the drugstore so I could get, like, the you know medical sewing stuff and gauze you know everything um just the full like uh first aid kit just to have with me to take care of her and uh but i wanted to give her a chance to come to her senses and decide that she doesn't want to have a drink that might not necessarily he's not going to like stand in her way given everything we've been through it's like maybe this you know giving in to your to your addiction like is a better alternative than what what might happen otherwise so he doesn't know but he wants to give her a, like some breathing space an opportunity to make a different decision if he doesn't that's okay but well how about we play time. that out uh, we don't have to play it out you've already summarized that part of it but let's have it open in the bar we'll say come stone is at the bar it's kind of crowded it's saturday night but you guys managed to get a table. So we open up with you at a table and you're actually kind of stitching her at a table. Like, uh, yeah. and you're just like trying to move this bar light that's hanging over the table to like see better, but it's so dim. Like this is a horrible place to work. There yeah. is no cell phone flashlights. You know what I mean? You're just kind of yeah. like trying this is to work. It's a horrific scene. Just watching a <laughs> yeah, guy but you're like keeping doing, it low key performing you stitches. Want, yeah, you don't want people seeing yeah. this. So you're kind of keeping it If anyone it were it. looking, yeah, yeah. If anyone were yeah. like looking right at me, like, oh Jesus. Like, right. Really fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> we're in a booth. We're in a booth and we're kind right. of trying Bobby's up. sitting at the table and he is uh, getting, uh, he's sitting there covering you guys as well, uh, offering yeah. a body to block other people from seeing you. Roger is getting a round of drinks from the bar and he's getting Vicky a drink at this stage. And this is when Murnau goes in and, you know, expresses his feelings. You don't have to do this, but if you think blah, blah, blah. And what does Vicky say? I rolled off screen against my just straight power. Uh, not even with my sanity damage or anything like that. And I rolled 67 above 65. Oh, oh. bottoms up. And I bottoms think, up. I think with, <laughs> oh, no. Frank. I think with everything that has been going on, like mechanically, I think Vicky would get a drink. Unfortunately, she can't call her sponsor right now. She can't talk to Christopher. There's 
just so much happening, and I, I think she would do it. This has been such a messed up day. This day, this day started with you reading that book at the library with your yeah. sponsor. <laughs> yes. And then being followed by some foreign dude and then talking to meeting Roger on the steps and like talking through all the shit he's going through mentally with this, you know, and then you as well. And then, I mean, it's just, it's been a hell of a day. She asks Roger as he goes up so to So Roger comes, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she says, can you get me, um, can you get me a dirty martini um, with uh, gin, gin martini? And she says it like, in a weird way. Like she's like, try it like, please. He does so. And we'll cut to him coming back with four drinks. Sorry, I spilled some of it. You always do if it's a an up martini. Impossible <laughs> not to spill. <laughs> I look like a fool carrying this tiny little thing. <laughs> <laughs> the stem shatters just from him picking it up. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> Sorry, get another one. Yeah. And here's your grasshopper. <laughs> Yo, yeah, I'm Neil late. loves grasshoppers. Yeah, a little yeah. late for I wanted a, a pink lady, drink. actually. I want a pink lady. A pink, pink lady. lady. Yeah. It's a little late for a cream-based drink. <laughs> I, it's, you know, that's... I'll be down. And uh, one, one and one for you, make sure. That's right. Shoots it. Shoots it. Shoots it. Half, half, of, half of the beer is gone. Well, let me talk to you for a second, Bobby, as you're sitting there. They're dealing with this. Uh, you don't have your pills. It seems like you kind of have been relying on this as a way to keep keep regular, right? And now yeah. Yeah. you don't have them. What, what's going through your head in terms of what are you going to do about that? He needs more drinks he, he needs more drinks just to ed- cover the edge but so he'll drink it away tonight he's gonna drink it away he needs uh he needs a shot he downs half the beer in a minute he's he's getting ready to to get up and get another round but he's really just just trying to center himself and just get get grounded he feels like he's f- about to f- just fly off of into the into space he has no idea he just needs to to get a grasp of what's real and the alcohol is helping to kind of weigh him down. Okay. So let's go to what you guys are talking about. Right before you got here, Neil said, yeah, well, you know, I think we could move forward with this. Bobby said we have to burn the whole building down. We need explosives. Vicky said, I want to destroy everything in that place. And Roger said, whoa, whoa, slow down. So now the four of you are together. Um, who's leading the conversation? Roger's got a thing to throw out there. You know, once everyone, maybe everybody's starting their drink and it's, it's quiet for a little bit. No one's speaking and Roger's like, can we just, for a moment, talk about what we think is going on here? So much has happened and I don't know if we've really taken a moment to analyze the situation, however strange. What the fuck is actually going on here? That building, that building seems to be a nexus of some, some kind of crossroads worlds. I don't, I don't understand it. It's, it shouldn't ex- it shouldn't exist it's some kind of space molded into something similar that our minds can understand it can interface with but I don't know why I don't know what the ultimate purpose of it is but it's it's not good I thought, I thought it was Darabondi. And after all that information that you found me now about, and you, Bobby, about Darabondi, I thought he was, you know, like an evil entity or something. But now, uh, the superintendent, this, this, it's almost like a god. Mm. I, I don't understand. It surpasses all other things. And, and the plane ticket, 
And um, Rourke, I, I, the times don't make any sense, but I think that's because it doesn't exist in time or space. I think, you know, people can have access to this night floor, hotel, whatever, in the past, in our present, in the future. My only concern is that we eliminate this as a threat. That is our mission. But my only concern is what if we, you know, bulldoze the building, but it doesn't change the night floors. The building still exists a year before we did this. And if they build another building, maybe they can get back to it. You know what I'm saying? Does that make any sense? It does. You're right. And she finally smells her gin martini and takes a little sip. And it tastes, unfortunately, very fucking good. <laughs> Puts it back down. Well, at this point, we know this, this, the night floors have Abigail. That much we know. She went into the party, so she's... Gone. She's gone. Also, I'm getting off topic because it's not even part of our fucking mission. But what was going on with that other agent that I saw? Who got sucked into a fucking hole in the ground in the building and disappeared. I mean, he's dead for all I know. Going back to your original theory, if this exists constantly in the past, present, and future, this guy, if he's the same guy on that ticket, came in here in the future, maybe to save us. So what if we destroy that building? We destroy our own existence as well. Jesus. I need another round. I'm getting another round. Bobby gets up. She finishes hers. Bobby comes back with another round. The other question is, Messiah, the hotel that I saw in the reflection with the flagship, with the with the flag in it. We, I mean, what is that? Are there multiple locations? Can you access the night floors from different buildings? If that's the case, destroying the building's not going to do shit. I feel like you're right. It all it all goes back to Darabondi and his situation with these kids. I want to find out more about what happened to these children. I feel like one of the answers lies in that. My one regret is when we were there, we didn't try to go outside. What if this is another New York and that building we were looking for only exists in that reality? But then again, I didn't see any windows. I didn't see any outside. Kids, though. Something about the kids. So you're thinking there's some way through the night floors? To some other... Other space? Other world? All I know is that... Michael Whitmore, the, the DEA agent who was on the bed... He said... New York City... Is where it started. So... I mean, if there's an alternate... New York City, whatever that means, then yes, makeshift, maybe there's like a way to get to this other place through many buildings, many places. The only way out is through. Why do you keep saying that? Just like, sort of lifts his hands up, repeats it, the only way out is through. What about these? Sydney, are you getting arrested? (laughs) I have to go. My parole officer is here. (laughs) It really did work for the New York City ambiance, though. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I was just coming back into New York. And everyone looks out the window as the red lights play on their face, and then they turn back. It just got exceptionally loud. I thought they were literally coming into your apartment. They did go down my my street. I have very old windows. New York City, baby. (laughs) Old windows, new mic.
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> deadly <right>. combination. <laughs> Taking it all up. What? Uh, what about these books we found? We haven't really spent much time digging into those. Yeah, that was uh, Murnau. I, I think he's gonna. I was gonna say, like, I think he's gonna pull out the alternate history book that he found and just start like flipping through it as this conversation is happening. Hmm. I can't remember if you had time to really look through that before or not. I don't think I did. Um, A History of the Russo-Germanic Hegemony, 1911-1921. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. I think you did. I think you did look through it. Yeah, maybe I did. Oh, wait. Um, Well, you know what? Cursory. Maybe you didn't. Um, Let's... uh, thinking we had history or there was history involved and Bobby was like oh, I know history <laughs> well okay I'll tell you as you're flipping through it I'll just give you a brief overview of what you see you know if you had looked whatever um, it has no author and it discusses an invasion that happened in Europe through Turkey uh, this it, it's an invasion that is called the Black Wind, uh, and it is fought by a Russian-German alliance. They they fight together to fight back the Black Wind that invaded. It appears through Turkey in 1910, and the Ottoman Empire. Hmm, the, yep. Yeah. Uh, and the book is mainly focusing on the Russo-Germanic Pact and not the Black Wind. It doesn't give a lot of details about the Black Wind. Um, but there's one thing that jumps out at you as very strange, which is a uh, battle that uh, appears called the Siege of Yatil. And it's even noted that it's sometimes pronounced Yihitel. This is like a city that you've never ho- heard of. And it has pictures of this place and it's a black and white photo of a palace and it's called uh, the siege of Yatil so you could research this palace you know a palace that looks like this Um, but yeah okay back to the library the um, drink in hand the book (laughs) says uh, in the fine print underneath the front it says published 1924 by Eben Publishers of Alar, comma, Carcosa. Oh, 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 get the fuck out of town. (laughs) What? (sighs) Okay. Wow. Now, I'm not sure what this means to you guys. Um, I don't know how much you actually did with Carcosa. I think you heard Michelle Van Fitz say that she was in Carcosa when he said where are you but other than that I don't know that you know this name I don't know if we went into in depth on it or if Neil knows it I'm not sure yeah I think there was some confusion on my part of like whether Carcosa if it existed as a as a concept in fiction the way that it does in our world if, or if it doesn't here if it's like this is not like we we've heard of Carcosa you know there's been True detective, everything, but but if in this world it's not since it's actually real, there's not the sort of fictional idea of it, so no one's heard of it. It would be in that play though, The King in Yellow, that we found that I don't think any of us have really dug into. Right, because right. we as, shouldn't as players read it. We're afraid, <laughs> right? We're afraid, right? Yeah, I mean, I just want to, you know, reiterate the one thing that you knew, Neil, is like, you had some inkling of this, you had heard of this, uh, you know, that it's a that it's a play and that it drives you mad and everything. And even if it was just an old wives tale, with what you've seen, and if any, any measure of it is true, it's quite deadly. Yeah. Okay, so, well, I think just even being, okay, since it is a real thing, like in this world, I think that Neil, with his like super high like art score, would have heard of it. You know, even though this is something that would be very, very sort of obscure in this world. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, so this is this, so this is like he sees that publishing location, Carcosa, and it's a chill like straight through him, you know, from this wives' tale, this old wives' tale, and yeah, and then he's this is uh, it's a big red flag or a yellow flag, as it were. <laughs> what about that book, A World Without Doors? Did that? Do we, is that still in our possession, or did we take that from the night floors? Vicky has it, and uh, it, she it never... Mich Michelle's room, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Vicky has it, and you never told me that you dug into it. It's um, several hours, you know, of work to read it. But she can pull it out. She puts it on the table. Um, she says, I didn't I didn't have a chance to look at it. Going to get another round. This is A World Without Doors by Emmeline F. Fitzroy. Hmm. Three pink ladies. Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we need to delegate then how we move forward and what we do. Are we looking for more information? Are we destroying the building? I mean, we can't, we can't be too hasty and we need to do this within, you know, our jurisdictions. We can't just set fire to a building and she looks at Roger well we I can't uh, <laughs> we have to try and figure out how many innocents will die but certainly some will but there'll be casualties of a greater war uh, no I'm well yes we can't kill people but also I was I was just saying this cannot come back on me or any of you I assume I'm just saying that building is abutted to two other apartment buildings it's a good chance that those will go up as well. Could always ring the fire alarm in those buildings. See if people wake up in time. It's not. Run it's out. not. It's not connected to any buildings. Oh, it isn't. No, it's like it's a large. It's a large building that has sort of like grass all around it, like little black fence kind of all around it. So it it, it is separated. <clears throat> so I'm backtracking. It's like, well, at least it won't. End, uh, the fire won't spread to other buildings. I could do a controlled demo. Get down into the uh, lower floor. Put some. Uh, C4s all around the base. Make it fall in on itself. I did a couple of those jobs. That sounds good, but, but Vicky made a good point. We don't know if that will actually destroy the night floors. We don't know if it's gonna just, you know, if somebody builds another building over it, if it just comes back, we need to be sure. And there's always the chance that now we've been to the night floors, just destroying it would kill us as well, since part of our psyche will live on forever in that world. But I'm just spitballing. So back to a plan. Well, uh, let me just add something in here. I don't, don't want to steer you too much. I just want to make sure that all this knowledge is kind of dumped out because it's been a lot of stuff. Like, yeah. yeah, I think we have to like the, the study argument, all of this before we decide anything. Right? Sure. Just remember that the argument that like they could just build another building there um, is... It is faulty insofar as, like, you don't know this building to be just a regular building. You know that, right. like, the person that built it was primed to do the night floors, right? And yeah. you know yeah. that this artist – now, this goes back, Neil. This goes back to Santiago at the at the art uh, – uh, at the gallery, at the Mercury Gallery. Um, he said that she – that um, – Abigail was so excited to do this piece, this uh, series themed piece, whatever, skid your uh, camera is out of focus. This uh, themed piece about the, uh, about this play that she had found at a bookshop uh, on the east side. And then he, sh and then uh, Lewis Post told you that she, that th this all started when he gave her, when she gave him the play, when she gave him the King in Yellow. So it's kind of like that play itself began to change these people's lives. These people were not born like this, you know? Like, they kind of, they, they were artists in their own way, but then when they were exposed to this thing, it opened up something else. So, um, you know, this ar the argument that you could just build another building there, it doesn't necessarily follow. A lot of other things would have to go in the same exact way Okay. for it okay. to be an, an, another entrance or something. Got it. Okay. okay, okay. I really feel like the Rosemary's Baby analogy 
is the perfect analogy for this. <clears throat> it's like, instead of a deal with the devil, it's a deal with the king in yellow to like come to my world of hedonism. I mean, this is metagaming and uh, luxury uh, and everything you could ever want in life. Uh, if you're dealing with like a starving artist, might, you know, am I like an off? It's a vulnerable population. It's kind of, yeah, it's like, kind of the way it is, isn't it? It's like it's, uh, it's a party, and everybody's like dressed extravagantly. And it's just like fine drinks and like whatever. It could be tempting to a, a New York struggling artist, right? <laughs> but that you know, the the recompense for all of this is that Haster will come and kill everyone on Earth. <laughs> I mean, that's the traditional Cthulian thing. It's like, all you gotta do is come to my party and worship me. Here's the drawback. I am going to yeah. take over your world. Uh, rule really. over the ashes. <laughs> Total human yeah. annihilation. Yeah. Um, Jesus. So... This is why Roger, I mean, Roger didn't know all this stuff. Right, like, exactly. And also, like even metagaming, guilty. even metagaming, keep in mind that, like, that even is just a theory. Like, you don't know enough about the king in yellow. <laughs> yeah. This is right. a campaign. There's more to right. learn. You know what I mean? Um, but but right now, there's... Um, you just have the problem right in front of you, right? You got the mission right in front of you, and that's yeah. kind of what you got to deal with right now. So part of that mission, we know Abigail's been taken by something supernatural. She's She's gone to the party. She's in the Night Force. What... What follows it? I mean, do we need to know exactly what happens to her in the night floors? Or no. fuck Abigail? Like, I, yeah, I don't go back to the mission it's again. Over. Find it's out over. if her disappearance was unnatural, and then destroy. if it was, destroy it. He doesn't yeah. care where she is. She he doesn't need the girl. He just is like, <laughs> get it out. You know? Also, as soon as we were told, like Vicky wanted to save Abigail too, and she feels this weird connection to her through her dreams and stuff. Like she's been having this weird, like I have to save her. But more and more, she's I think realizing that like it's impossible. There's she can't go to the twelfth floor. She can't go to the party. Like Abigail is gone. Um, but also, that's just her. doesn't Rourke say that like she chose to go? They had a party right. for her, and you can still know logically like. She was twisted by you know evil like that's that's totally legit, but like it's hard to argue like she went, you know. Yeah. Even if uh, we did find her, do you think Abigail would be like, yeah, I hate this place. Let me come back. Like I'm sure she's like a dancing marionette up there. Like whoa, good yeah. time, great party. Yeah. Roger, after a few drinks now, is starting to think, and he's like, another thing we got to think about is how do we know if we can trust. Agent Marcus. And something in the back of Roger's head, he has this weird memory of not knowing if the handler that gave him the operation was trustworthy or leading him down the wrong track. He doesn't know where he has this memory of like (laughs) being on an operation where something was at odds, but after a couple of uh, vodka sodas, he's like, that guy was nervous, too nervous. Yeah, and I'm thinking about the clown and that painting that had us in it and and him him choosing that that site just the feeling that we're being watched is uh is yeah let me just say for a second then as you're like getting deeper and deeper in three one and ones a couple beers we look at bobby and we just see that and he doesn't have his pills and it's just like the little dimples of sweat you know little droplets like just started appearing and he's like wiping the sweat off the oh, ah, ah, it's, it's, um, there's uh, Oasis is playing or some shit like, you know, uh, it's like people are all pushed up against each other it's kind of a crowded pub kind of like vibe and Bobby you're like wavering uh, and as you look over, you see that it's one of those bars where it's like a long bar, but then there's above it, there's like a whole kind of, uh, there's like a, a uh, like a wooden top bar thing, right? Where there's like behind the bar, there's glasses up there and like extra liquor bottles that are like storage up there and stuff. Uh, there's glasses that hang on racks up there, you know, for the bartender. But what the people see on the other side is just like a nice wooden kind of round thing and they just kind of see the bartender in it as you're kind of wavering and looking at this and the bartender serving drinks, you can see 
from the bartender's, the edge of the bartender's uh, wrists and back, you see strings that are going up. Oh my God. Into where the glasses are. Today is back to you. And all of a sudden, you get this strange feeling that the bartender is like being pulled around and serving drinks is like. Reels the way I do. Does any does anybody see that? I don't believe that anybody. <laughs> does anybody does anybody see that? He says Bobby that. says that. Vicky's like laughing about something. It kind of like touches Roger's arm in a way that's like a little <laughs> too friendly and is not paying attention to Bobby. And I'm just uh, Murnau is just like he's just flipping through the book. He's like he's flipping through the pages of this book, the, the Russo Germanic hegemony. Okay, he's not paying attention. So either. Bobby says that nobody pays attention. And for now, you're looking at, uh, I'll come back to you in a second, Bobby. You're looking at this picture, and you turn, and you look, and you turn. And as you're looking at the picture, this black and white photo of the palace uh, on the page, you turn, and uh, you know what? I'm going to gonna do this myself here on roll 20. Um, if, you, if you look at roll 20, you'll see that the book that now... Um, that uh, Abigail seems to, or I'm sorry, that uh, Vicky said, wow, that was a Freudian slip. Uh, <laughs> that Vicky seems to have, uh, has not read yet and sort of set down on the table. Uh, you see the cover of that book that Roger brought up, A World Without Doors. And as you look at it, you see closer when you look at the artwork that there is a golden inverted palace upside down on the cover of this book uh, and it is a depiction of the same palace you see in a black and white oh. photo <laughs> oh, in the book you are flipping through <laughs> whoa and he's like he puts his hand on the book the uh, world without doors on the table and like sort of turns it around so the castle's facing right way up to his, his vision and he lays down the other book with the black and white picture next to it and he just kind of like a cigarette in his mouth like sits back huh uh, Bobby says does anybody see that and nobody's hearing you Bobby they can't hear you over the din of the place he's just looking around he's sweating he's feeling claustrophobic all of a sudden Shirt feels tight, <sighs> and then you I, uh, look, and then you look back, and there's no strings. You don't see any strings on the bartender. Uh, oh, I, uh, I think I'm starting to feel it. <clears throat> I think I'm getting a little tipsy. You wanna? What'd you say? You want another one, Roger? Could you grab? Could you grab another round? I do another round. This is her fifth martini. Oh my God. <laughs> She's going to be so sick. Yeah, she's uh, gonna throw up. All right. Well, tell me oh. what the goal is for tonight. Come Get to a decision. Blackout. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> or, just, faced. or just party. No, come to a decision. A plan for yeah. tomorrow. But Vicky is plan. already plan. Too, too far gone. Um, yeah. To, I think at a certain point, like they real, I think we. I, probably realized like we can only do so much and yeah. we're now we're in our cups a little yeah i think um, we have to this is just blowing off steam like, yeah. yeah necessary yeah. and i don't think any decisions are going to be made tonight but meeting tomorrow yeah right. except tomorrow, for another a plan to meet again tomorrow That's, is oh god sunday sunday sunday, sunday. oh my 20th. god these days are so fucking long <laughs> yeah, I know. oh god sunday <laughs> sunday 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 okay oh wait yeah right yeah it is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we'll make a plan to meet up in the morning. Right. At a, like a diner, like a luncheonette place or something. Right. Yeah, the uh, Gramercy Diner, 23rd we, and 3rd. We're going over those books. We're going to pour through them. Yeah. Uh, okay, then you all go your separate ways this evening. Everybody's going to well, go home. No, yeah, what are you going to um, do? As... We are like stumbling out of the bar, and uh, people are starting to uh, disperse. Roger um, looks at 
Vicky and kind of gives him her the look, or maybe even whispers. Um, I, uh, live in the basement of a townhouse over by a gay couple. <laughs> <laughs> That's hot. What? <laughs> Say that again. You live in, I, I live basement. in the basement of a townhouse owned by a sweet gay couple. <laughs> uh, I have a bird. Yeah. I have a, yeah, it's nothing uh, special. It's just uh, just kind of. Where do you live? Settled Manhattan? Up on the Upper West Side. Ooh, um, fancy. Do you. Um, She's wasted. Do you want to um, see it? <laughs> Your bird? <laughs> no, my uh, my apartment. Yeah, I'm jo- I was a, that was like I was joking. You I can see Jimmy you. too. You can see Jimmy. He's cool. Um, mm, and she like pats herself. Oh fuck! I left my bag. And she goes back to the bar, <laughs> gets her bag, comes out five minutes later. <laughs> Probably just smoking. Maybe the other two have taken off. <laughs> it's like uh, I just I want you to be safe, and I yeah. can keep you safe. That w- I'm actually, um, yeah, I'm, I don't want to go home. I'm actually trying to avoid that, um, in my life. So, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll call a cab. I open a cab. He opens the door for her. And, uh, as she gets in, he says, I have a first date. <laughs> <laughs> she smiles at him. <laughs> Funny. And he gets in afterwards. The two of you get in a cab. What do, what do you do, Bobby? Uh, he, uh, Bobby's stumbling home. Uh, where are we? I'm 30. We're, 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 I mean, we're, if there's nothing you specifically want to do, you can just no, say you're going home. Yeah, I'm just going to go home. Just going to go home. Bobby's go home, home, pass out. Yeah. Ice cold. <laughs> yeah. What about Neil? He's gonna gather up the reading material. Gather and, uh, up your jackets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe he did. He took his jacket off, I think, at the bar. As this case, this big, big purple, like button-down shirt. Right there. <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, so he's gonna. Uh, yeah, he's gonna hail a cab and head back to his his, uh, his place. He's sitting uh, in the back of a cab, just kind of wavering. So many pink ladies. Yeah. <laughs> and you just hear the voice again. Oh my God. As if it's sitting in the back with you. Alone, we are lost. <laughs> I look at the voice. Where it sounds like the voice is coming, he like turns his head and like looks at the space or looks at the voice coming from. And he says, the only way out is through. And you hear. <laughs> yeah, and he starts laughing too. Uh, <laughs> Cap driver's immediately regretting this pickup. <laughs> Saturday nights, goddammit. <laughs> Okay, uh, and Vicky, you are going to Roger's basement apartment. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, we'll just cut to the cab pulling up, and uh, and uh, the door opening. You two getting out, and you're just heading in. I'm rolling a dice and up and down <laughs> to see if Vicky throws up and falls asleep, or <laughs> if her and Roger. Bone. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold, wait, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, yeah, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Before you roll that, uh, you are you're not leaving. You're 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 like going in. You're either gonna throw up and fall asleep or bone. But you're yes. going in. Yes. <laughs> okay. Could this be an opposed roll? <laughs> also, she lives in Queens. She's taking a cab all the way to the west side, and it's like 2 a.m. She's either going to stay there no matter what and right. wake up and go see everybody, or she's going to go back to late. Queens. You don't sure, sure, sure. You don't I just didn't want to take too, ma- too many liberties. But no, 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 um, no. I just want to say that the scene that we see, though, is the cab pull up, and your doors open, and you guys are kind of like stumbling up to the door, and as... 
Roger gets the door to the townhouse open, uh, you go in, and just as you guys are crossing the door, we see slowly pulling around the corner is a car. And it's just kind of easing up the block strangely. When the cab, when the cabbie finishes uh, doing whatever they need to do, you see the, the brake lights dim, doop, and the car and the cab starts to drive away from Roger's townhouse uh, on the Upper West Side. And then pulling up and right into its place is another car. The lights go off. The door opens. And a small man, we can't see because of the shadowy light, Joseph. gets out. And from behind, we see an unknown silhouette just looking up at the building at the townhouse. And we'll pick it up there next time. Oh, oh my God. God. Oh. Oh. I thought, I thought, Joe, I thought you were going to say a small clown. Obviously a clown car. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Twelve other small men get out. <laughs> I was hoping. Get out. I was hoping. I was hoping there was going to be the mechanics of Vicky and and Roger hooking up. <laughs> like, oh, it's like that's Roger. That's a real clippy. Next yeah. time. <laughs> Roger drops his pants. Roll a sanity check. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. We shall see. We shall this see. This is the Arlington Night, everybody. Thank you guys so much. See you next week. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>